So good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here in Dublin. Um, I'm Amanda Brock. I'm the CEO at Open UK. And as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here with you in Dublin. Open UK also has a stand in the booth room and the, the hallway on the ground floor. And it's at S27, so conveniently placed near the food and coffee. Come and have a chat with the team, many of whom know more about this topic than I do. So ladies and gentlemen, I, I thought I would start by introducing myself. I would talk a bit about Open UK, and then I would explain how we got into working on sustainability. And then I'll talk a bit about the deliverables we've already had and the deliverables that we're planning this year and a little bit about how to get involved. Hopefully they're gonna give me a clicker because I like to wander about, but I'm a bit laptop bound just now. So I often get asked how a nice lady like me ended up in open source. And frankly, back in 2008, I joined a company called Canonical, which is the UK's biggest open source company still, I think. It definitely was Europe's biggest when I joined, although it became Europe's biggest while I was there, I should say, because I was employee 165. And I joined as a lawyer, the first lawyer. I was general counsel, the, the head lawyer, and I ran the legal team globally for five years. And if you don't know Canonical, I'm sure you'll know Ubuntu, the operating system. Um, I was about to digress and start telling you stories, but I've only got a certain amount of time, so I should keep going. There are lots of stories about Canonical and Ubuntu back then. We were the cool kids on the block, or at least we thought so. As well as my background as a lawyer, I, I pivoted away from that five years ago, became CEO of Open UK at the end of 2019, brought a more diverse group of skills together that I, I hadn't used enough, I felt, as a lawyer. And I do a number of other things around open source, which I continue to do after I left Canonical as well. I sit on a number of advisory boards. I'm in a number of governance groups and have been over the years, a number of groups around the legal side of open source. And I chaired a uh, UN advisory, the UNTIL labs, the UN Technology and Innovation Labs, until those were wound down during lockdown. And it was an open source and IP advisory. So it was one of the first things that the UN had done to focus on open source. And it was a real privilege to work with them. I think one of the most interesting projects we did was a, a blockchain for the land registry in Afghanistan. And every time I see somebody talking now about setting one of those up, I, I sort of reference, go back to that one that's sitting there waiting to be used globally. I had my first sort of public appointment when the UK government appointed me to the Open Standards Board, the Cabinet Office Open Standards Board uh, last year. And then this year I stood for an election for the first time, which I have to say is quite a scary experience. And I stood for the Open Source Initiative Board and I'm part of the OSI Board. And of all the, the different boards and things that I'm on, I put that up there because I think it's really important. And I think for open source, if you hear me do any keynotes at other conferences, you'll hear me talk about the, the fundamental problem we have with the open source definition and making sure that that's well maintained and well stewarded so that we have a guardian of the open source definition. So that, that's critical really to the future of open source and the longevity of the success that we've seen. Um, in October, a book with my name on the front of it will come out but I'm only the editor and there are 23 different authors. Uh, they're the great and the good of the legal governance world of open source. Uh, also people like Steve Wally from Microsoft talking about community, Nithya Ruff talking about OSPOs. Um, you will never see my name as a sole editor of a book again. It's one of the worst things I've ever done. It would only, well, if lockdown hadn't happened, it would never have gotten over the line. It is so much work editing other people's work. But hopefully it'll be a really useful text. Now, it's £75 a book, and I'm here today to sell it to you not. It's also open access, and that's the best thing about it. The Veach Foundation have sponsored it so that it'll be open access. And what I hope is that it will create a resource that everybody can use and dip into. Um, I had the, the first version of the index, I think, two weeks ago, and I had 100 comments on it to try and make the index work in a way that you will be able to find the content that you want by the terminology that open source people or those learning about open source use. So fingers crossed that'll be a useful free resource. I also spend a lot of time speaking at conferences, and before lockdown, I traveled the world, and during lockdown, I spoke to this small kitten who is now a full-grown cat and a leading expert in open source. Frustratingly, when I get interviewed, he decides he wants to be on screen, and generally, he gets more airtime than I do. So at the end of 2019, as I say, I joined Open UK as CEO, 
And early in 2020, I pulled together a board. And the way that I did it is I went to the people I had met, they weren't all friends or knew, who I thought had the best profiles in open source. Now, as it turns out, there's a whole load more people in the UK who I didn't realize were in the UK, and I've tried to bring them together too. But my initial board sat down at the beginning of 2020, and they came up with a UK leadership vision for Open UK. A year later, we sat down and realized that that hadn't been quite right, and we reiterated it. And we are very clear now that it is about UK leadership and global collaboration and open technology, probably resonating a little bit with what Jim was talking about on the stage this morning, and uh, a lot to do with why we're supporting their setup in Europe. It was very important to us to build an organization that was diverse and that was about belonging. We haven't ever actively said to somebody, you should come and do this role, or we would love to have you because you are from a diverse community. But we try to make it easy for people from diverse communities to feel that they belong in our organization and our networks and to participate. And we really are very much a volunteer driven organization more so again than I think any of the other sort of country or policy organizations are. So we have two employed staff, we have a number of contractors, and then we have a team of about 100 to 130 who volunteer to run the organization. Chris, who's one of them, is in the room today. And um, this is my board. There's been a few changes in the last year. Then we have the pro bono leadership team. You'll see some faces that you recognize and some that you don't. And then we have about 50 UK-based ambassadors. We're going to be launching an international ambassador program later this year. And we're working to support some organizations that want to set up an Open UK equivalent in their countries as well. So Open UK is slightly different in that that UK leadership and global collaboration is focused on the business of open technology. So what makes us different, firstly, is open technology, not open source software. So software, hardware, data, open source software, open hardware, open data. And we want to bring together the business of open technology. Now that might sound like we're really focused on companies and not interested in people, and it's actually the opposite. We're really interested in everybody who's working in that space in the UK. We don't care who your company is. We don't care who you work for. So we don't care if you work for a UK company, an international company, a tech company, an open source company, or a non-tech company. And we work under three pillars, community, legal and policy, and learning. So we build a compute, yeah, if I could say the word, we build a cohesive community, and we do that by bringing together the leadership, some of whom you've just seen, across open technology, and then we celebrate the work they do. And we do that through things like our awards, through uh, honors lists, through blog posts, through podcasts, showcasing what they do. Uh, we put people forward for a number of awards. And then we use that community for our second pillar, which is legal and policy. And we use the power of their collective voice to influence that and to try to ensure that the UK is a great place to do open technology. Um, our legal group is very active. We were recognized very quickly by the European Commission, this is early 2020, as the UK organization for open. And then we participated in a couple of things in the US. So the legal group responds to all UK legislation that we think is relevant. We just responded last week to something on the measures of success of digital regulation. And our point was that if you measure it by looking at royalty generation, you're never gonna capture open source properly. So we do that kind of thing. We also do it beyond the UK and we do it in Europe and the US where appropriate. We were the only non-US organization to submit as part of an amicus brief in the Google v. Oracle litigation. And we also, I think, are the only non-US organization to have to responded to the Biden ordinance last year. I'm getting to sustainability, don't worry. So we did our first reporting last year, and we understand that government needs to see reporting, public sector needs to see reporting, and actually so does the enterprise. And we started with one report, and as we were getting to the end of it, we realized it needed to be more. So we phased it over three phases. You might wonder what NASA's got to do with this. The UK, I think, was the third biggest contributor to the uh, Mars landing last year to, oh God, I've got the names gone, um, Ingenuity, the little helicopter that was taking the pictures. And Ingenuity actually started as a science project that was moved into the main mission at NASA. Again, I'm diverting. So these three reports together 
from a, a moment in time in 2021 for the UK. And we start by analyzing all the data that was out there already because nobody had done that for the UK. And then we look at through a survey and we had about 300 respondents in the UK. I think it was about 320 last year in the UK alone um, on adoption. And we're able to demonstrate economically something like 46.15 billion of contribution to GDP in an economic terms from open source. But then in the third phase, we move to the values plural. So we move to thinking not just about economics, but the other values that open source brings. And this was a purely software piece of work. And it starts to focus on the sustainable development goals and the SDGs and the non-economics where open source can contribute in things like skills development, collaboration, recycle and reuse, and sits really well with the UN's goals. Um, this is the phase one from 2022, and we've packed a lot into it because phase two is going to be out later this month or early October, and it covers security and infrastructure. But phase three, which will come out in November, will purely focus on sustainability and the, the role of open technology and sustainability. Um, and uh, George, who makes these great infographics, is in the room. This is just one he did. I think my resolution may not be good enough for the screen. So the third pillar, we talked about community, legal and policy, is learning and skills development. And you'll notice in our logo, we've got um, three dots and a circle. The three dots are supposed to represent open technology, so software, hardware, data. The circle is the community, laws and policies, and the the community of the future whose skills we're developing. So you have a community, you use their voice to influence law, and then you you train and you um, empower the community of the future through skills development. And we've done a few things. A couple of years ago, it was quite high profile when we did our first kids camp. We've given away over 8,000 digital gloves to school kids in the UK so that they can do two different summer camps. Each camp is 10 lessons. The second one is about sustainability. It actually teaches the, uh, the open source definition, so one definition per lesson, and then it talks about the sustainable development goals and aligns the goals to the different elements of the open source definition. And I think it's probably the first thing to teach kids um, both the open source definition and to teach kids the combination of open source and the values of open source and how they align with the uh, sustainable development goals. There's also 10 um, magazines, e-zines that go with the lessons. And our chief sustainability officer wrote a couple of pages for each. So if you have young people who are interested in sustainability, it's a really good resource. And that's just a couple of the images from it. So if I go back, oh, I'm going the wrong way because I don't have a clicker. You're seeing all my slides. No, totally the wrong way. Help. Yeah, this is really... Right. End of slideshow. That's definitely the wrong way. Help me, please, somebody. I don't know why I hit, but I hit the wrong. Let's, there we go. Right, let's go back. So we get to the end of Open UK. Thank you, Chris. Spoiled all the surprises. Right, let's do this back up there. Hopefully they'll edit that out if they're doing a video. Now we have nothing. Oh, there we go. So we started working about two years ago in sustainability. And I think the UK, possibly more than almost anywhere in the world, started to look at this because we were going to host COP26, the convening of the parties for the United Nations. And that started to focus the press, the media, and hearts and minds in the UK on sustainability. And I went to a former colleague, Christian Perino, who had worked with me at Canonical, who was an open source person, who I knew had moved into being an entrepreneur in sustainability. And I started to speak to Christian about what we could do. We looked at how we could be part of COP26. And you can see all of our historic and our current work at this URL. But Christian came on board last year, and I think we are the first open source organization to have brought somebody on in that type of role as a chief sustainability officer. And Christian takes a very holistic view, which has influenced where Open UK has gone, and which I very much agree with, which is that we try to do sustainability by design in the same way as you do security by design. So everything we do, we try to think about it. 
my current um, flight pattern, to be very honest with you, bothers me. And we're trying to work out how I offset that with other things that I can change because there's only so much I can do about it. But we didn't just bring Christian on board. We also set up a sustainability strategy and environmental policy, which is Creative Commons, and it's on our website if anyone's looking for one. And that has rules around our travel, and we try to focus on taking trains wherever we can. Um, we have a whole set of principles that we live by, but it also goes into our supply chain. So when you see things being given away on our stand, they will have been ethically and locally sourced, down to things like our pop-up banners and stuff when we have any control over that. But we really focused on what we could do about COP26. What could we take to COP26? And we put a submission in for the main COP. We didn't get in. So we started to look around at what else we could do. And I spoke to someone I knew at Federated Hermes, initially about them being one of our partners. And they gave us this. And this was a fringe venue immediately under the hydro in Glasgow where COP26 was. And they gave us this whole suite, this whole suite of tents for 24 hours. So we had a space for 24 hours where we were able to celebrate open technology for sustainability. And we kicked the conference off with some young people interviewed by Christian talking about uh, sustainability and why it mattered to them because after all, it's their future. The space was incredible. You can see the main convention behind. Uh, we had a bit of the polar ice cap which had drifted away from the main one. We didn't have it cut off, but it was brought by the base camp that is monitoring the progress or the diminution of the polar cap. And you could actually stand next to it and hear it popping. It was quite incredible. Lord Maud, who is the former cabinet minister in the UK, who was responsible for the UK's sort of world leading open source first strategy over a decade ago, keynoted the event for us. And we had a number of panels through the day and we had mostly people based in the UK, one or two international partners, but we really tried to encourage people not to fly to it. And um, all of these sessions are available, recorded online at our COP26 URL. I have to say Lord Maud's keynote had a, a lot of people in tears. It was really impactful. So if you're interested, you, you might want to have a listen to that. And on our stand downstairs, we've got a bit of a mashup playing as well. There's also a series of podcasts, what we did with the Uptime Punks who came over to Glasgow and recorded many of the speakers. And the thing that we took to COP26 was our first blueprint. Now our first blueprint was for the data center of the future. And when we started to plan a project for COP, my idea was that we should do something which brought as many different open source technologies to the fore as we could and edge computing, um, containerization, virtualization, those kind of software technologies in data centers are all really important and they're mostly open source. There's a huge amount of open source software contribution. There's also a lot of work going on in open hardware, which um, allows reduction of the amount of hardware that's used in data centers. So the concept of building a model for a data center that would be carbon negative or neutral, that would be using derelict property. And as we saw lockdown roll out and we saw city center property, department stores, things like that become available, we realized that those would be a great place to put an edge-based data center closer to the end user, actually improving the, on the technology that was delivered, but pulling together all these open source um, technologies. And I'll show you how a blueprint looks in just a second. The way we did it was we started by breaking down the component parts, and then we looked at those component parts in this way. And there is a whole blueprint mapping these out, demonstrating resources, which are the open technology pieces. And when we finished that, we launched it at COP26. There's a really nice video. It's called Patchwork Kilt, and it's in the Eclipse Foundation today. Um, I'm not even going to try and make my video link work because I'm having so much success with technology. You see last year Red Hat sponsored us and Federated Hermes obviously gave us an in-kind sponsorship giving us that incredible space. This year we've been sponsored by Intel and they're sponsoring all of our sustainability work. And the sustainability work this year is going to be shared at, um, this is the Dynamic Earth Centre in Edinburgh. 
and on the 16th of November we'll have a free event in Edinburgh that everybody's welcome to come to which will look at what we promised, what we looked at last year, what the speakers were talking about last year and take it one step forwards. We'll stream some of it into COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh and we'll have somebody at least, one or two of our speakers will be speaking from Sharm El and we'll hook them up together. But that's the event, right, if anybody's interested in coming along. And you'll see that we've got the... Um, I know what I've done. It's this. Yep. If I hit up or down, that's where it goes wrong. Anyway, uh, you'll see that we've got the hashtag COPEN27, and we'll keep that going year on year with different COPs. So we've already applied for observer status for COP28, and we, we hope to host an event there next year. So the blueprint model is one that we think is replicable, and we think it helps to focus the elevation of open technology, of open source software, open hardware, open data into sustainability. We think that the, the values, the requirements, the principles align really well between the SDGs and the open technology communities. And we think that we need to look at how we have more adoption of those technologies, but also how the principles that we've all learned to collaborate by are taught into that sustainability community. And if any of you work in sustainability, what you'll have seen is that it, it's difficult to get people to collaborate. That community are quite inexperienced. When we talk about metrics, one of the things that we've not focused on is metrics on carbon emissions, because so many people are working on it already. It, it's just not a good thing for us to create yet another one. But there, there are so many people focused on that, and it would be great if they could be brought together. So this is uh, a blueprint that uh, Chris Lloyd-Jones is leading for us. Chris is here in the audience and trying to do my IT support in his spare time. Um, this is the electric vehicle, the EV charging blueprint. And we've started in the same way as we did with the data centers, working out what the, the basic requirements are. And then we have, oh, I've done it again. No. There we go. Um, I thought I'd another slide on this, sorry. Um, we then started to break it down into the three areas that the people, process and governance and open technology. And we will pull this together using the same templates that we've used for the blueprint for the data center to build out. Now, the, the goal of doing this is twofold. One is to build something that is really useful in EV charging. EV charging is a hot topic. We think the more open technology that you can bring into it, the more innovation there will be the more opportunity there will be for new entrants, the more collaboration we'll see. Interoperability has been a huge problem in this sector for many years, even down to things like the plugs at the charge points not being interoperable. Tesla had their own for a long time. It's just been fixed, I think. So we think it's a really useful area to engage with because, of course, the better the charging is, the better the vehicles are, and the more emissions will be reduced. The second piece of work we will share in November, on November 16th, are societal value metrics. Now this is totally innovative. It's something that nobody else has done before. And we look in our reporting constantly at the economics. And I would love us to focus more on this and less on the economics, but we have to do both because when we talk to governments, when we talk to politicians, they wanna see economic value. And for us to encourage more adoption, we have to be able to show that. But these societal value metrics are the bit that differentiate, in my mind, open technology from the rest of tech. And what they give us is values that are specific to open source. And we've adopted quite a rigid process. We've been going through a, a literature review. And we, we did that to understand the landscape in technology and beyond. And it's been really extensive. But we were trying to work out what we were measuring, what the values we're measuring against are, and what the measurement output will be. Now these slides, I think, are already on shared, but I'll, I'll also put them up there if any of you want them. And I just want to give you the, a, a concept, uh, an idea of the scale of the literature review. And then, and we'll share all those links, you know, if anybody wants to go off and read stuff. Looking at the metrics, we started to look at some particular projects that were out there and how they were doing it and did we just lift the the SDGs the way they are the sustainable development goals and try and measure straight against them do we try to localize them and in some ways reinvent it which would be nice not to do but which seems to be the common way 
to do it. And one of the problems that we saw, which Christian is absolutely obsessed, might be the right word for it, by, is having a non-economic measure. And it's really difficult because the easiest way is to end up equating the skills development, the education for kids, the free use of software, taking the, the software or the hardware into emerging markets, you know, reuse and recycling, to add that up as an economic value and demonstrate the, the economics. And as he said to me, you can't value love, you can't put a price on love, Amanda. So we, we are really trying hard to find a way to demonstrate these metrics that are non-economic. And we, we looked particularly at three. There was three that really stood out as we were going through the literature review. One is the Digital Public Goods Alliance, who many of you know. They don't cover open hardware, and they focus on the overall projects, not the component parts. So we had some concerns about some of the, um, the, the ways they were doing it. There's nothing wrong in what they're doing, but for what we want to achieve. And then we looked at um, another social value measurement in the UK, and again, it came back to monetary. And then we looked at the Scotland National Performance Framework, and that's one of the best things that we've seen looking at how you, you, you uh, measure and create good metrics in non-economic ways. And what they've done is, just as I was explaining, they've taken the uh, sustainable development goals and they've localized them to suit the, the purposes they've got. So for us, we've broken down the SDGs into a number of themes. Um, you can see them up on the left there, and then again, my, my infographic's a bit fuzzy, um, on the right. And these numbers come from our survey. I will focus more on them in phase three of our report. And the numbers show that 48% think that open technology doesn't promote and help sustainability, whereas 52% does. So we'll dive into that a bit more in phase three. This is the... Do you want that, Chris? There you go. Um, this is the format that we're going to use for the metrics, and it's similar to the, the blueprint. It's as simple as we can make it. We've tried to keep it very straightforward, very logical. And on the, the left, you'll have the theme and which SDG it is. Then you'll have the outcomes indicators and the open technology metrics. Um, I probably will take this out before I share it because Christian will kill me if he knows I've shared his, uh, his metrics before they're ready to launch. So this is a sneak preview. But that's the kind of thing you will see. And I think it helps to really see that contextualized. So we will get some decent metrics that you will be able to go into in any project. And where we're now working out a couple of projects that we can apply them to, we're considering where we, we do that as a a sort of minimum viable product test for Edinburgh. Now I've mentioned State of Open. This is the uh, this is the July 7th version, and that has the link to it there and Christian's little report on the work that we've done so far this year. I'm gonna hand over to questions, but what I will say about the metrics is there's a huge amount of work going into producing them. And we've asked questions in our survey that nobody else has asked. So the world of open doesn't ask them. And we can do it because we're small and we're quite agile and we're willing to take some risks. So we asked questions about sustainability that haven't happened anywhere else yet. And we asked questions about value in a way that they haven't been done before, trying to show even on the economic side, that open source shouldn't be measured by things like lines of code going in, number of developers or engineers that you have, but it should be measured by the value that it generates. So our focus will stay on the values and there will be this economic value generated and this values that align with the sustainable development goals. But it will be V1.0 in November when we look at the metrics and we will need lots of collaborators to help us year on years to improve that. And I suspect you'll see V2.0 at COP28, V3.0 at COP29, and it will just keep evolving in a collaborative way. So I'm being told from the back that I've got about two minutes. I don't know if there are questions, no questions online. Any questions in the room? Sal? Mike, will I give her the mic? Yeah, there you go. So. 
as you put these together, um, coming from an enterprise point of view, are you going to compose these in a way where we could actually use them like as defined KPIs or SLAs? So I think the IBM guys this morning were talking about this with City and the ESG need and how important that is. Yes, I don't know if we will be able to create scores in V1.0. It's been a big project, as you can imagine, but that might be the kind of thing that we refine. We've been, I think at COP26, we had an economist, uh, Will Page, join us, and Will wrote Tars and Economics that was published last year. He's at UCL. And he said, we're measuring the wrong things. Uh, he's ex-Spotify, and he, you know, when he looks at music, we're measuring the wrong things. When we look at open source, we're measuring the wrong things. When we look at open technology, we're doing the same. Um, we are also trying to engage with some other UK economists. Uh, we work with somebody at the National Statistics Office, and we're trying to engage with a couple of quite senior economists to look at how we can do that. So I really hope, but I suspect it'll be V2 or maybe even V3, because it is a big undertaking. Anybody who's interested, um, the next slide should have, but it doesn't, my details on it. So uh, I'm at Amanda Brock UK on Twitter, amanda.brock at openuk.uk if anybody wants to contact me and talk about getting more involved. Um, admin at openuk.uk also works to engage in any of our projects. But we will try and be as transparent as we can and keep talking about this at different conferences, do some podcasts and writing around it as well. So please, if, if you're interested, if you want to get involved, if you just want to take it and use it, everything we do is CCSA. So please attribute us, but feel free to take it and go and do your own thing as well. Am I on time? Stop. <laughs> Thank you.